Happy Halloween, TikTokers! Our week dedicated to this creepy holiday is still going, and although our Scary Tuesday didn't coincide with the Night of Nightmares, we wanted to bring you an original tale that would truly give you goosebumps. It was Halloween night, and the police station was almost empty. Half of the officers had permission to be at home during the holiday, while the rest were patrolling the streets chasing criminals who took advantage of the hassling and bustling to steal things or commit vandalism. Only two people stayed at the station to deal with people coming in and answer calls. Sergeant Mike was also staying, who was in charge of watching the station at night. He was doing it gradually. While he walked through the dark basements with his lantern as his only companion, he couldn't stop cursing and thinking about how great of a time he would be having with his small son, going door to door, trick or treating. Poor Timmy, he was so upset when Mike told him the news. If he could at least buy Timmy some gift. But the department had cut the salaries and he barely earned enough to make it to the end of the month, let alone to spend on toys. He reached the storage where the evidence for closed cases was stored. It really gave him chills having to walk between boxes filled with bloody clothes and weapons used by murderers. Thus, when he suddenly heard a heavy thud, his heart started to race. He ran towards the hallway where it came from and saw that one of the cardboard containers had fallen from the shelf, probably ruined due to the humidity of the place. From inside, another smaller box had fallen. It was wooden, painted with drawings of clowns and vibrant colors, and with a crank on its side. Without a doubt, it had to be some sort of musical toy. Mike inspected it from top to bottom, and when he saw it had no marks nor stains, an idea came to his mind. That could be the perfect gift for Timmy. Surely, he would get very happy with it, and nobody would miss that music box after such a long time in there. Mike decided to try it out first. He turned the crank and the melody of the popular children's song Pop Goes the Weasel started to play. But suddenly the lid opened and a smoke of color and confetti came out, so thick it made it difficult to breathe. The cloud took a while to dissipate. But Mike soon noticed he no longer was alone. Someone else was there now. His suspicion was confirmed once he heard a macabre voice. Mike, what you doing cooped up in here? Don't you want to play with me? He focused his lantern through the colored fog and couldn't believe what he was seeing. It was a strange figure with white skin, empty eyes and sharp teeth. Its body was even more grotesque with its arms hanging way under its waist and wearing a clown's dress. Uh, well, a more sinister version of one. Mike was so perplexed that he couldn't react when the creature grabbed his neck, raising him in the air. They call me Laughing Jack, and I've been trapped in that damn box for way too long. So tell me, what do you want us to do together? While he struggled to not suffocate, Mike took out his weapon and shot Jack several times. However, the bullets just went through him as if he were a ghost, landing on the wall on the other side. Oh, so that's what you want to play. Let's do it. With a quick movement, Jack snatched Mike's gun and shot him in the foot, leaving him on the floor, in pain and bleeding. But Jack didn't stop there. He continued to torture Mike by shooting his arms and legs while he yelled and screamed on the floor. You know what? I'm bored of this. Let's just finish it. Jack pointed the gun at Mike's head, ready to pull the trigger, when he suddenly heard a crack behind his back. The bullet holes on the wall started to break and the pane started to fall apart, exposing a wrecked blue door. It started to open with a creak and from it appeared a new creature just as sinister and threatening as Jack. It was a tall and slender figure with red hair and green eyes. It also had sharp teeth and its long arms ended in grotesque claws. Mike thought he was hallucinating, 
what he was seeing was worse than any nightmare. However, Jack only reacted with a grimace of disdain. The hell are you doing here, Jason? Shouldn't you be fixing your little toys? Precisely, I came looking for one that's broken, responded Jason. Suddenly, with a supernatural agility, it made a huge jump and landed behind Jack. From his pocket, Jason took out a huge mechanical key and stabbed Jack in the back with it. This time, Jack was actually hurt, but in a supernatural way. As Jason kept turning the key, Jack screamed in pain while his face disfigured itself with the most atrocious and impossible of grimaces. Only its mouth remained open, and from there, a dense and dark surge started to come out. Mike had a hard time distinguishing what it was due to the dim light, but when he heard an animal squeal and the sound of hundreds of little legs, he realized it was a swarm of cockroaches. All of them rushed towards Jason, covering his body almost completely and immobilizing him with their bites. A group of them concentrated on his chest, opening it wide. Then Jack, triumphantly, took the mechanical key out of his back, shoved his hand into Jason's chest, and from there he extracted another small musical box. This one was simpler, with the shape of a chest and entirely painted in vivid blue. Jack held it high while looking directly at Jason. Oh, what a shame. I think this one can't be fixed. He squeezed the box with all his might until the strong it, and even though it was made of wood, the box disintegrated into a bunch of dust. The cockroaches liberated Jason, who fell to the floor, exhausted, to then go back into Jack through his mouth. Jack burst into a booming laughter, so jarring that Mike had to cover his ears. Meanwhile, Jason, with the small shred of life he still had left, was crawling on the floor, apparently trying to escape. Are you leaving so soon? But we're just getting started. But suddenly, a threatening smile appeared on Jason's face. As impulsive and foolish as always, aren't you, Jack? Haven't you realized it yet? Jack's expression also changed when he realized what Jason was holding in his hands. Jack's own box. I did the best I could, but you didn't come out as well as I wanted you to. Jason opened the lid and Jack promptly started to howl in pain with such a low and deep scream that it sounded like a hundred wounded wolves. His face and the rest of his body started to decompose until finally disintegrated into a cloud of colors and confetti, which was immediately sucked into the box. The lid shot on its own after sucking the last bit of the cloud and the squealing finally ended. Then Jason carefully placed the box back inside his chest and the flesh around started to slowly close on its own, until not even a scar was left. Mike was still immobile on the floor. Despite the intense pain he was feeling due to the wounds, he couldn't even blink due to the grotesque scene he had just witnessed. Jason approached Mike and took a good look at him. What a mess, but I think we can fix it. Oh, and little Timmy needs a new toy, right? Jason's claws slowly approached Mike while he closed his eyes. The next day, Timmy's mother was serving him his breakfast while trying to conceal her worrying. Mike should have been back from his night shift by now. She also realized little Timmy was holding under his arm a new toy she didn't remember buying. When she asked him about it, he said that he found it on his bed that morning. It was a stuffed bear wearing a police uniform with a big bottom on one eye as it fit wear an eye patch. One more afternoon, she didn't feel like studying. Maria was lying on the sofa watching one video after another on her TikTok. She was actually quite hooked lately. She wasn't the type to dance or anything like that, but she did upload other types of content. And that's what she was doing when she saw a pose that caught her attention. It was a bit strange. You could simply see a person with his back turned walking down the street. What surprised her the most was the music. It was creepy, but she loved it. 
mixture of fear, liking, and intrigue. So she quickly started thinking about what she could do with it. She wanted to use it. That took her all day, boredom had left her out of ideas. But she did it, she recorded a video with absurd transitions, which with the music seemed to transport you to another place. She was happy with the result, so she uploaded it and started watching the new season of Sex Education. It was late, so she didn't use her cell phone again that day. She logged back into TikTok the next morning, and by then it seemed like everything was different. Not a single dance video appeared anymore. No trending songs or challenges either. She spent more than an hour trying to find those videos that usually filled her For You page, but there were none left. At first, she didn't think anything of it, she thought it might be a glitch in the app. But in the afternoon, when she came back from school, things were still the same. She restarted her phone and nothing. The only videos she could see were very similar to the one that had caught her attention the day before. People walking down the street with that strange melody. She stared at her phone for hours, but it just kept getting worse and worse. Now those videos were increasing her intrigue and were becoming more and more terrifying. One person chasing another, someone being grabbed by surprise. And to top it off, she recognized some of the places that appeared. They were close to her house. She tried to stay calm and think, and then it occurred to her to tap on the music to see whose music it was and what other people had used it. She needed to know if the same thing had happened to them as to her. The profile that had uploaded the content was the strangest. It had no associated social networks and there was no way to contact it either. But this was not the case with the accounts that had used the same tune as her. At the beginning, there were none. In a couple of hours, she found two and by the end of the day, there were five. She chose one of them, accessed the profile and clicked on the button that would take her to her Instagram account. Her name was Sarah, and she had the profile open, so she directly wrote her a message. Hi Sarah, can we talk? I need to ask you something. She hit send and immediately realized that she had been very diffuse. It would have been better to explain to her directly what had happened. But she didn't have much time to think about it because Sarah responded within a minute. Does it happen to you two? Her story was virtually identical. They talked for quite a while and both decided to contact the other people who had to use the music. It was impossible with everyone, but they made a group of five. They were scared, so they gave each other phone numbers and created a group on WhatsApp. By that time, the videos had increased the tension even more. They weren't violent, but you could sense that they stopped just before a tragic outcome. They watched them over and over again, wanting to find clues. But they didn't know what was going on, and the creation of the group only made it worse. One of the people in it sent them a link that would allow them to detect anything strange on the phone. They were all very scared, so they agreed without thinking. At first, everything seemed normal, but the next morning, they all had horrible videos in their galleries. Now they were totally explicit. You could see how someone kidnapped people in the street to put them in a black van. Afterwards, you could see people crying or even body parts scattered around. It was horrible, and the worst thing was that no matter how hard they tried to erase them, they were still there. The person who had sent the link vanished completely. Two days later, they also started receiving threatening text messages with very specific personal data. They knew their address, their parents' contact information, and much more. They were told that if they went to the police, something bad would happen to them. They tried to stay calm, but soon members of the group began to disappear. Little by little, strange things happened. They looked like accidents, but ended up with someone in the hospital seriously injured or even dead. The others saw the news on TV and couldn't believe it. It was true, they were being killed. Maria was one of the last two active people in that group. She was very scared and knew she could not stop something bad from happening to her. So she accessed TikTok from her sister's cell phone and recorded a video. In it, she explained what was happening to her. As soon as it was uploaded, it went viral. There were many more people suffering the same thing. It was a kind of macabre challenge. Then the police started to investigate. But when they tried to contact Maria, she had already disappeared too. 
She had been run over right in front of her house. Coincidence? A chilling legend circulates among the Japanese that speaks of a female spirit with the lower half of her body missing. They say that she crawls with hands that end in long fingers, with claws capable of cutting meat as if it were butter. She moves with its claws making a very unpleasant noise, from which she receives her name, Teke Teke. Legend has it that Teke Teke is the ghost of a very introverted young woman who is the target of several teasings both in high school and outside of it, but the day came when one of the jokes ended worse than expected. Taking advantage of the fact that it was cicada season, some bastards had prepared a joke, placed one of those bugs on her to laugh at her while she tried to take it off. As a group, they followed her carefully, making sure not to be seen. The girl arrived at a small train station. It was late and there was hardly anyone there. It was the perfect time to proceed. One of them sidled up to her and carefully placed the cicada on her shoulder. When she felt something move next to her and saw the bug, she jumped and shook herself trying to get it off her, but slipped and fell onto the tracks. The assailants were too distracted laughing to notice that the train was about to arrive. Before anyone knew it, wham, the train crossed the station at full speed. At that moment, they heard a scream that silenced them. Frightened, they approached the tracks and there was the dismembered body of the young woman who no longer screamed, no longer moved, only hate and pain could be glimpsed on her face. The students went home and swore not to tell anything about what happened. She was a very strange girl, a depressive, everyone will believe that she got tired of living and threw herself in front of the train, they thought. And so it was, everyone thought that the poor girl had killed herself. One night when the boys were laughing at what had happened while they were going back home, they began to hear strange noises in the nearby streets. Little by little, they stopped laughing and became scared. With each corner they crossed, the sound grew louder, until one of them started running. He thought he had escaped. He looked back to make sure he was safe. But when he looked back, his companions heard him from afar. It was then that they began to run without stopping. As they crossed the last street, there was the dead girl without her legs staring back at them. They wanted to run away, they were paralyzed by terror, they couldn't believe their eyes. So the spirit took out a sharp little scythe and killed them by splitting them in half. Since then, the Teke Teke wanders through the lonely stations in search of more victims in order to calm her anger. But you don't trust. There are stories that also place the Teke Teke in other places, besides near the tracks. The story of a young man who left school very late one night has come to our ears. He was on the street when he realized that he had forgotten his house keys in the building. When he turned to go back, one of the windows still had light. The boy could glimpse in at a beautiful girl who was looking at him. He was fascinated, and then the girl jumped out of the window, launching herself into the air towards him. What seemed beautiful before now seemed horrendous. The girl was no longer beautiful at all. Her face was emaciated, and half her body was missing. He could see how she was still bleeding. He wanted to scream, but he couldn't. He wanted to move, but he couldn't. He was completely petrified with terror. He already knew that she was the Teke Teke. The spirit was already upon him, and in a matter of seconds it ripped him in half with its own claws. The next morning his companions found brutally skewered legs, but the upper part of the trunk never appeared. There's a very similar entity that is usually related to the Teke Teke, the spirit Kashima Reiko, which belongs to a girl who was brutally abused in a Hokkaido train station toilet. The assailants abandoned her, leaving her for dead, but she was not. Kashima crawled for help, but there was no one left to help her. Then she fell onto the train tracks. The tracks began to vibrate. The train was close. Before she could scream, the railway sped by, skewering her legs. This didn't kill her instantly. She spent a lot of time begging for help, but no one showed up. Finally, she bled to death. Now she haunts train station toilets, especially on the darkest of nights. She knocks on doors and asks the occupant, Where are my legs? And the victim has to answer, on the Meishin Expressway. If you answer anything else or are too hesitant to answer her, Kashima won't hesitate to walk through the door and brutally rips the legs off whoever's inside. The legend of Teke Teke, although relatively recent, has marked the Japanese population and already has two film adaptations in 2009. Train stations are a common place of passage in any city in the world, so remember, be very careful in them, especially if it's night and they're almost empty. 
and if someone knocks on your bathroom door, prepare yourself for the worst. We were by the river. The fire was burning and the flames were shaking. The bells rang, letting us know it was 11 o'clock at night. Suddenly, it all went dead silent. Nobody laughed, nobody talked. We could only hear the rustling of a cold wind. Then, a woman came from the woods. We heard a painful and muffled cry. Oh, my children. Do you know who we're talking about? We are talking about La Llorona, the weeping woman. A woman with a ghost-like appearance, dressed in white with long dark hair, who floats in the air with a soft veil covering her horrifying face. She comes from the west and goes towards the north, wandering and crying around the streets. La Llorona is a ghost in the Latin American folklore. According to oral tradition, she is the lost soul of a woman who lost her kids and wanders around trying to find them, and is scaring anyone who sees her or hears her with her horrible cry. A sad story, a horror story of lovesickness and treason that has been passed on from generation to generation. This legend has many different versions depending on the region you are in, but they all agree on something. She always shows up near the water and her cries are deafening. One of the most popular versions tells the story of a beautiful young woman of humble origins. She was the lover of a nobleman. For a time, they were very happy and had three kids together. But one day, he left her without explanations of any type. Soon after, she found out he was marrying somebody else. This destroyed the heart of this beautiful woman. Heartbroken, she decided to take revenge on him in the cruelest way she could think of. One night, she woke the kids up and took them for a walk near the river, close to their house. Blind by anger, a terrible rage possessed her and she could feel all the love she felt for them turn into hate. She drowned them until they were all dead. She suddenly reacted and when she realized what she had just done, she started running desperately into the river until her body was completely covered with water. She made that terrible cry and disappeared. From that moment on, La Llorona became a wandering soul. She walks around the streets looking for her lost kids, crying and yelling, hence her name. People say La Llorona attracts kids who misbehave, so she can take them to the river as an offering to be forgiven. She seduces adults with her beauty to take revenge on the one man that betrayed her. But when they try to take her veil off, they discover her white gaunt face and her eyes trying to dig in the deepest parts of the soul to trap them in her cries. There are many people that say they have seen or heard her cries. Her story still scares little boys and girls, but also adults. The origins of La Llorona are not very clear. Ancient cultures believed in ghosts that appear next to rivers. Some historians think that in Mexico, the origin of La Llorona can be related to the Tihuacoatl, goddess of the Mexicas half woman and half snake. According to the legend, she comes from the water of the Lake Texcoco to cry for her children. And even though in Mexico La Llorona is one of the most important figures in popular culture, there are many other countries with a similar legend. In Chile, she is known as La Pucuyen, a soul in purgatory believed to cry eternally because her kids were taken from her arms when they were very little. This ghost can only be seen by people when they are really close to dying, as well as people with special abilities. In Colombia, they talk about the Tarumama, the wandering ghost that walks around the valleys and mountains, close to rivers and lakes, dressed with a black robe that covers all her body down to her heels. Her face is a terrifying skull, and in her eye sockets she has two incandescent balls. She carries the dead body of a baby and she cries tears of blood. These are only some examples. In other countries such as Venezuela, Uruguay, Argentina, Panama, El Salvador, Honduras, España or Costa Rica, they also have the legend that tells the story of the ghostly presence of this wandering young woman. Tic-tackers, do you also have the story of the Llorona in your country? What other popular legends would you like us to talk about? Leave a comment and let us know! It was horror week at school, and like every year, the seniors went to see the works of their high school classmates. They liked to watch the older kids because they imagined that someday they would be like them. Sandra was 11 years old but quite childish, and her favorite thing in the world was Frozen. 
She couldn't stop singing the song and had a thousand things from the movie around the house. So when she saw on the poster that the older students were going to do a scary frozen skid, she was thrilled. She arranged to be in the front rows and looked forward to the day. Once there, she was even nervous to see what kind of change they would give the movie. She was afraid that they would distort Elsa's character so much that she wouldn't be recognizable in the end. But as soon as her co-stars started, she forgot all about it. In the story, Princess Elsa of Arendelle also had her magical powers to generate ice. But in this case, she was bad. But really bad. As you know, in the movie, Elsa accidentally hurts her sister while playing. Well, in the reenactment, she did it on purpose. Elsa is very jealous that her parents spoil Anna so much, so every time they are together without adult supervision, she tries to hurt her sister. Anna adores her sister, so she doesn't tell her parents everything she suffers. But one day, these games get out of hand and Anna ends up seriously injured. It is at that moment that the parents decide that they will isolate themselves inside the palace. A priest saves Anna and erases her memory so that she does not hate her sister, as everyone believes she did it unintentionally. But Elsa is still full of hatred, so during the confinement she tries to hide the fact that she is hurt and stops using her magic. She spends all her time plotting a plan to murder her sister. While watching this, Sandra is completely thrilled. Since the show started, she hasn't taken her eyes off the actors. She loves this new version of Elsa, who is evil to the point of wanting to kill. The performance continues and continues with the death of the sister's parents. But the surprising thing is that this is also Elsa's doing. It is seen how when their parents board the ship that will take them on a trip, she freezes the captain and his best man. Thus, they cannot survive at sea and they all die. Elsa has her first part completed. She has gotten her parents out of the way. Now, it's Anna's turn. But suddenly, the castle is open to visitors and among them comes Hans, with whom the youngest of the family immediately falls in love. That makes Elsa have to rethink her whole plan. But she soon discovers that her future brother-in-law has no good intentions either. So, she decides to pretend she is angry and leaves the palace. Anna runs to look for her, she is sent practically alone and ends up getting lost. Because of the delay, her now husband Hans goes out to look for her, but days late. Anna manages to arrive, and once alone with her sister, she freezes her heart and locks her in a room. In theory, Hans could free her because the spell would be resolved with love, but Elsa knows Hans won't do that. When the man arrives, Elsa tells him her plan, and together they make up a story of Anna's unfortunate death. Meanwhile, Anna watches her body freeze a little more each day. It is a slow and painful death, and one from which she cannot escape. So Elsa is left in charge of everything and finally puts an end to the being she has always detested, her sister Anna. The play ends and people start to get up, but Sandra remains seated in her seat, undeterred. A teacher asks her to please move, and then she does react. She is shocked by what she has seen, and that night she can't stop dreaming about the performance. In the following days, she can hardly sleep, and her behavior changes radically. Her mother notices her strange, but she thinks it's just an age thing. She doesn't give it much importance. Until one afternoon, she returns to the living room and does not see her little daughter in the crib. She asks Sandra where she has put her, and Sandra, with astonishing tranquility, says, She's in the freezer. I've done the same thing to her as Elsa did to Anna. Jeff was walking in the park under the rain, crestfallen, covering his head with the hood of his white hoodie. It was nighttime, and everything around was pretty deserted, except for a couple of unsuspecting people jogging around and two lovebirds kissing in the shadows. They were usually easy targets, the perfect victims for the blade of a sharp knife. 
However, this time around, he wasn't even looking at them. His mind was somewhere else and his homicidal instinct was completely off. And that wasn't just any regular day, it was his birthday. For the first time in years, he remembered his own birthday. It's like he wanted to bury that part of his life, but it resurfaced again. Five years had passed after that bloody night that transformed him into who he was, and he could feel how he was getting older. It was a dumb thought, but it was one he couldn't shake off his head, especially in that day. He walked and walked with the hope of rekindling his passion for martyr and make him forget everything, but it didn't work. He suddenly saw himself walking around a residential neighborhood that looked familiar to him, although he didn't know why. Maybe he did one of his famous killings there, but the place seemed different. Finally, he raised his head and when he saw an abandoned and rundown house, he realized he was in front of his old home, the place where everything started. Did he arrive there subconsciously? He couldn't be certain, but suddenly he saw himself tearing off the boards nailed on the door and crossing the doorway. What he found disappointed him greatly. The crime scene no longer shined as before. The blood on the floor had disappeared under thick water stains, and the phrase go to sleep, which he so carefully wrote on the wall, was now covered with a message written in lipstick. I need you, please call me, love you, Nina, and a phone number. He felt pretty depressed, his original work, the essence of who he was, had now been covered by the passage of time and perturbed fans. He turned to the living room and a weak light caught his attention. He got closer to the table and what he found there made him open his eyes widely as if he still had eyelids. It was a birthday cake, a delicious cherry cake, his favorite, especially due to its blood-like color. It had exactly 21 candles. Jeff took out his knife to cut his lies and read the message written on it. Happy birthday, brother. He turned around and he saw Liu wearing his leather suit sitting over the backrest of the worn-out couch. You're so predictable. Jeff's first reaction was to take a defensive stance, although deep down he was happy to see his brother again after so long. I hope you enjoy the cake. It was made by Jane. She also wanted to see you face to face, but I decided to reserve that pleasure for myself. Jeff heard a muffled scream and saw Jane in the corner, tied up and muzzled, struggling to free herself. He approached Liu with his hands up as a sign of peace. This might sound weird, but I'm happy to see you. The family is finally together again. Liu's expression changed in an instant, and he plunged towards Jeff. You are not my family. Liu tackled Jeff, breaking through the living room's glass door, and his knife fell to the floor. You stopped being family the night you almost killed me. Then Jeff knocked down on the floor with glass shards all over him and filled with cats suddenly started laughing. <laughs> Liu was perplexed. If you're still alive, brother, it's thanks to me. It was me who called the ambulance just before leaving the house. Liu grabbed the knife from the floor. Liar! He then tried to stab Jeff, but he dodged the attack. And with a swift kick, Jeff knocked the knife from Liu's hands to then grab it from the floor. Liu looked for something around him to defend himself. He grabbed one of the rusty metal bars of the stairs handrail and teared it out with fury. He grappled with Jeff until immobilizing him on the floor and then started to unleash his rage on him by hitting him in the head repeatedly. The scars in Jeff's permanent smile opened again, painting red his pale face. Liu kept unleashing his wrath on Jeff until he suddenly felt a piercing pain on his side. Liu moved away and saw his own blood flowing out of his abdomen while his brother kept laughing. <laughs> Just like that very night, remember? However, instead of cowering, pure fury took over Liu and he stood up again. His face was so menacing that for the first time ever, Jeff decided to step back and then escaped by rushing upstairs. 
Liu followed him slowly, as if relishing the moment. The rain intensified and many drops were falling on Liu's face, who didn't even react. The noise of the water drops hitting the roof was constant and the moonlight getting through the windows barely illuminated the house. He entered the room's hallway, strongly grabbing his metal bar. When he heard a whisper, Liu, it's time to go to sleep. He faced his room's door and slammed it down with determination. He didn't see anyone there, but suddenly Jeff plunged towards Liu from behind and pushed him, making his head hit the desk and making him lose his metal bar. Liu tried to get up while stunned and Jeff tried to knock him down with a sucker punch. Go to sleep, goddammit! But Liu seemed undistractable and even managed to snatch Jeff's knife and stab him in the leg, making him fall. The two started in an ending grapple, trying to get the weapon and cutting and wounding each other relentlessly. At one point, they no longer felt pain, only rage. While blood covered both their faces in the floor, Jeff eventually managed to pull out of the grapple and ran to the hallway to try and catch his breath. Liu, seen for the very first time fearing Jeff's eyes, felt so powerful that he threw the knife to the floor and started to fight him with his bare fists. Both were covered in wounds, so each new hit felt like a stab, with blood spurting out each time. Little by little, they approached the window at the end of the hallway, and when Liu noticed, he smiled with malice. He pushed Jeff to throw him through the window, but although he broke through it, Jeff managed to grab onto the ledge with his flayed hands. Liu felt disappointed, his strength started to fail him and Jeff seemed indestructible. And suddenly, Jeff managed to climb up and plunge towards Liu. But something transformed Jeff's evil smile into a terrified expression. At the end of the hallway, a couple of faces appeared in the middle of the darkness. A middle-aged man and woman with deadly pale skin. As they got closer and their shape became clearer, Jeff recognized them. Mom? Dad? What are you doing here? He stepped back towards the broken window. Don't come closer! Leave me alone! Liu, surprised, turned around but couldn't see anything. Maybe his brother was hallucinating? Jeff was breathing nervously and kept stepping back, feeling scared. Until he saw them by his brother's side. Liu felt that it was the perfect moment to finish the fight. And now it's time for you to go to sleep, Jeff. With a tackle, Liu threw Jeff through the broken window and his body flew 10 meters until it crashed on the hard concrete of the backyard. Outside, the rain had finally stopped. Liu went down to examine the body of his brother, feeling his neck and chest to make sure he was dead. He put the knife on his lap as if it was a funeral of a warrior and crouched down to whisper some words into his ear. Sorry, I had to end this. And in that moment, Liu felt a piercing pain on his side once more. He saw Jeff's disfigured and bloody face who could barely move his lips and he said, This isn't over yet, brother. Dizzy and with no more strength, Liu fell down lying on the ground next to the body of his brother. Both of them were together once again in the backyard where they played so many times when they were little. And as both of them heard ambulance sirens in the background before losing consciousness, Liu weakly pronounced a phrase, Happy birthday, Jeff. Today, we'll talk about the Jikininki, also known as human eating ghosts. These are the spirits of human beings who had a very immoral day-to-day -day behavior in life. Once they die, they are doomed to search for human corpses and eat them. In Western legends, ghouls are a similar creature. Today, we'll tell you a story from Japanese folklore starring Musoku Kushi, a priest member of the Rinzai school from the Zen movement. Musu was traveling alone through the Mino province, a mountainous and sparsely populated region. The night fell and the priest searched for a place to use as shelter. When he didn't find any house around, he finally decided to spend the night under the stars. 
However, in the last second, he luckily discovered a faraway hill with an anjitsu, a small shrine, on top of it. With resolve, Muso walked to the shrine in order to spend the night there. Once Muso arrived at the entrance of the shrine, an old priest who seemingly lived there greeted him in a very rude way. The old priest rudely told Muso that he never received anyone in his shrine and that he should try going to the village in the valley where he might find shelter. Perplexed by the rudeness of the old priest, Musu still followed his suggestion and went to the village, where, to his surprise, was very well received at the magistrate's house. As soon as he entered the house, Musu saw how the main room was filled with people that seemed to be mourning someone's death. But he was soon taken to a separate room so he could rest. Around midnight, a young man entered the room, took a bow before Musu and explained to him that his father had died very recently and that the people mourning in the main room were family members and acquaintances who went to pay respects and offer condolences. The young man also told Musu that both his family and the neighbors would be moving to the neighboring village because according to an old tradition from the place, they had to leave any corpse alone, as strange things could happen in the house where the body remained. Musu gave his condolences to the young man and felt a bit annoyed about not being informed about this earlier, as he could have managed the service for the deceased before everyone went away. Musu promised the young man that he would hold a vigil for his father's body, as he didn't feel any fear at all. After this exchange, the relatives and acquaintances of the deceased went away. Once Musu was alone and after carrying out all the respective rituals and prayers for the body, he held a vigil for the deceased during the night. For most of the night, there was no sign of danger, nor any weird noise. But suddenly, a huge and strange figure with a grotesque shape stealthily entered the room. Musu was petrified in shock. The strange creature looked like a decomposing corpse but with claws and bright eyes. The creature raised the body of the deceased, devoured it voraciously, and then proceeded to eat all of the food offerings left in the place. Once the creature finished its macabre feast, it disappeared. The next morning, the priest waited for the villagers at the front of the house. When they came in, they showed no surprise when they saw no corpse, as that wasn't the first time something like that happened. Musu told them what he had experienced, but nobody was surprised as the experience coincided with the stories they already knew about. Musu then asked them about the old priest from the hill. Didn't he use to carry out services for the deceased of this village? The villagers, surprised by Musu's words, responded that there was no shrine on the hill, let alone a priest living there. Musu didn't respond and just stayed silent. Did a spirit play a trick on him? He bid farewell to the villagers and filled with doubts in his head, Musu departed from the village and tried to return to the shrine on the hill. It didn't take long for Musu to find it. He met again with the old priest from before, who surprisingly bowed and apologized for treating Musu so rudely and for not giving him shelter the night before. The old priest then said that he was terribly embarrassed because Musu saw him in his true form, as it was him who devoured the corpse and food offerings that night. He told Musu how he became a jikininki, a spirit that devoured corpses, because he had been a bad priest when he was alive. For instance, he wouldn't do the rituals people paid him to do as a priest, as he was only interested in getting the money. Once he passed away, he reincarnated into that vile and deformed creature as a punishment for his immoral conduct in life. The Jikininki begged Muso to have mercy on him and do a Segaki sacrifice, a Buddhist offering celebrated in honor of hungry spirits so their punishment can finally end. After Muso complied with their request, the old priest in the shrine disappeared, leaving Muso kneeling before an old grave covered in moss. It all started when Tommy asked Marcus to stay with him after class. Everyone had already left the school, except for them. They headed to an empty classroom, and Marcus was really nervous. He was afraid of getting locked in there, but his friend asked him to please join him, saying it was something really important. They went into the classroom and sat on the floor. Then from his backpack, Tommy took out a wooden board and a glass. A few seconds later, Marcus got really tense when he realized it was a Ouija table. You remember Andrea? asked Tommy. Andrea was a student who died just a few months before. Her passing affected everyone in town, 
since she was found drowned in a lake in the early morning. Authorities declared that it was an accident, but for many, it was very strange that she would be in a lake so late at night and completely alone. Tommy and Andrea had something together. They never called each other boyfriend and girlfriend, but shared a relationship which went beyond being just friends. Come on, Tommy. You're not saying you want to use a Ouija board to contact her, are you? Asked Marcus in fear. I... I have to. I have to know what happened. And you're my best friend. There's nobody else I can ask for help. Marcus gulped and placed his index finger on the edge of the glass. His friend did the same, and they started the ritual by making several questions. Shortly after, they felt how a cold wind invaded the classroom, and the glass started to move on its own, stopping at particular letters. With his free hand, Tommy wrote on a notebook all the words that were being spelled. Together, they read the first phrase, Make him leave. Who should leave? They didn't know what that meant. Tommy asked out loud, and the glass started to move letter by letter again, spelling the name Marcus. Dumbfounded, Tommy asked out loud what was the reason. This time, the word spelled was jealousy. Why is Andrea saying that? Were you jealous of her? What was going on with you and her? Asked Tommy to Marcus. Marcus angrily got up, saying that he was messing with Tommy by moving the glass himself. He also said he'd never been jealous of him nor Andrea, that he didn't care about either. Marcus then grabbed his backpack and left the classroom slamming the door. The next morning there was an ambulance and two police cars in front of the school. A janitor found Tommy's dead body in the classroom, covered in blood. He was stabbed several times with his own pencil. Marcus said that Tommy stayed in the classroom when he left, talking to Andrea through the Ouija board, but nobody believed him. The police, after checking the school's security cameras, saw how the two friends went into the classroom and how Marcus came out alone, looking really angry. Marcus claimed he did not kill his friend, that he was angry at him, and that's why he slammed the door. He also claimed that it was Andrea who made it look like he was the killer. After many interrogations, Marcus was declared guilty and was sent to a juvenile prison. Later on, Marcus claimed to hear Andrea's spirit every day tormenting him and mocking him. She would never forgive him for killing her that night at the lake. Tic-tackers, we continue to analyze your favorite series to try to discover where they come from and if they have a dark or hidden part. And today, we have chosen for our investigation, Miraculous, The Adventures of Ladybug. This series was created by Thomas Astruc and produced by Jeremy Zag. We don't know if it actually had a terrifying background, but as you all know, the lovers of the network love to create alternative versions and give her a touch of terror to everything that seems innocent and good. Therefore, today we tell you how we and several internet users believe that Ladybug and Cat Noir appeared. Marinette was a 12-year-old girl who lived with her parents in an area of the West Coast. There, she was very happy. She had many friends and enjoyed her free time writing and watching movies. She particularly loved superheroes movies. She was so obsessed with them that in her notebook she was creating stories about special people with superpowers. Without knowing it, at the age of 11, she was already a fantasy script writer. But her life changed when her parents decided to move to another city. Her mother had a job offer that she could not refuse, so she was forced to say goodbye to her friends, her neighborhood, and everything she knew up to that point. They moved to East, where they rented a small country house. Despite her sadness, Marinette was curious and needed to keep exploring. Of course, she had taken her notebook and her movies, so her superheroes were always with her. And in her search for entertainment, she found the basement of the house. It was an area full of boxes and dust. It seemed like the former owners had not completely emptied it. She spent a long time browsing until she saw something that left her completely impressed. It was a very old book, and on the cover you could read How to Get Your Own Superpowers. She did not hesitate for a single second. She grabbed the book and carried it to her room. There, without waiting any longer, she devoured about 20 pages at once. She left it when her mother asked her to come down for dinner. When she finished, she was so tired that she went straight to bed. But there was something that was bothering her and kept her from falling asleep at all. 
She heard a kind of groan as if a baby was crying in the distance. She got up and tried to sharpen her hearing but couldn't tell where the sound was coming from. She convinced herself that it was a close neighbor and fell asleep. The next day, she asked her parents if they had heard the same thing, but they said no. Without farther ado, she went on with her life. A week later, when she had already read more than half of the book, history repeated itself. But this time, the sound seemed to be much closer. She couldn't stop listening to it and had the feeling that someone was in danger. So she ran to wake up her parents, but they did not hear anything. They told her it was the product of her imagination and asked her to go back to bed. History repeated itself in subsequent nights. Things got so bad that her parents ended up taking her to the doctor. He diagnosed her with a mental illness and placed her in a sanatorium. But she wasn't crazy and she wanted someone to listen to her. She tried to escape several times and took refuge in her adventure notebooks, but when she wasn't allowed to write, she completely collapsed. So, in an oversight by the guards, she jumped off an eighth floor. Incredible as it may seem, she managed to survive, even though only her heart was beating. She was in a coma, and in that estate, she entered a parallel world. She met another person, Adrian, who had the same dreams and aspirations. And just like her, he had tried to end everything, but he hadn't succeeded. They were hospital mates and had managed to connect their minds. Together, they dreamed of being two great superheroes. They were Ladybug and Cat Noir. So, I'll introduce myself. My name is John Coiffure, and now that the story of Ben Drowned has become popular, I'd like to clarify some facts that I've been researching on after his death. I'll start from the beginning. Ben and I went to school together. He was a very shy boy, but we became friends right away as we shared one passion, video games. One of our favorite games was The Legend of Zelda, Majora's Mask for Nintendo 64. Ben was a slim boy with blonde hair to his shoulders and his eyes were sky blue. Everyone considered him a weirdo because his personality was different. The bullies in the class, Matt, Jack and Alex, constantly picked on him. Matt was the worst of them. He was despicable and he had a scar on his lip from an old fight he usually bragged about. Awesome. Poor Ben's situation at home wasn't very nice either. His dad had died the previous year in a car accident. Right before dying, Ben had told him about his problems at school and he had calmed him down. I'll go talk to your teacher tomorrow. I'm sure it would all have a wonderful ending, right? He kissed him on his forehead and laughed without knowing those were his last words. Ben didn't smile much. The happiest I had seen him is when he bought the Majora's Mask game with the money he had been saving. He would spend hours and hours playing and he always had it with him. I wish I was like Link and I could be brave and face those bullies, he would usually say. One day, I went to his house to pick him up and go to school together. When I got there, he was playing the Majora's Mask game. I remember he saved the game in the Skull Kid face. Then, he put the game inside his bag and we left for school. During the break, he came to me, desperate, because Matt had been searching in his stuff and his game had disappeared. I went to the teacher's room with him to tell what had happened and we went to find Matt. Ben, are you sure it was Matt? The teacher asked. Yes, I saw him searching on my back. Don't worry, you won't see it again. I heard Matt whisper with a dark voice. The teacher asked Matt to empty his bag. There I was the game without the label. Ben asked me to hold on to it. He was afraid it would take it from him again after school. He told me he would call me to meet at some safe place and give it to him. When I got home, I was waiting for his call. 10 minutes passed, then 20, 30, and the phone didn't ring. I was worried. What if Matt and the others had done something to him? I ran to Ben's house with the game on my hand. Right before reaching his house, I heard cries and moans coming from the shore of a nearby lake. I got closer, and then I saw Matt, Jack, and Alex next to Ben laying on the floor, hurt. He was screaming in pain and covering his face with his hands. I stood there some meters from them and I saw Matt grab a wooden stick from the floor. 
You were saying you saw me taking your stupid game, huh? Don't worry, you won't see anything ever again. He put the stick in one of Ben's eyes and then in the other one. Ben was desperately screaming. The show was horrifying. I wanted to do something, but I couldn't move. Blood was falling from his sockets, covering his face and his clothes. I threw up and started crying. You shouldn't have done that, Ben said to Matt. Matt grabbed him by his neck and dragged him to the lake. He sunk his head in the water, drowning him while he laughed and laughed. <laughs> Jack and Alice got scared, and they ran away. When Matt finished his job, he let Ben's dead body go and left in the same direction. Nobody was there anymore. I got close to Ben, my legs were shaken. I held him on my arms, hugging him, without letting go of the Majora's Mask game that I still had on my hand. I remained like that until the police came. They had been warned by a neighbor. My best friend was dead, and I couldn't do anything to avoid it. I still have nightmares about this. When I went back home, I went to the bathroom to get rid of the blood. The Zelda game was also dirty. I wiped it and saw something handwritten on it, a word, Majora. I hadn't realized about this earlier, but I didn't think it was important. The next day, when I woke up, the game was gone. I looked everywhere, but couldn't find it. After telling the police about what had happened, they sent Matt to a juvenile detention center. Three days after that, his death under strange circumstances was on the news. They said his eyes had come out of his sockets while he was playing The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask. On the TV, they showed a picture of the game. It was exactly like Ben's, the one I had, with the same handwritten word. I almost passed out. I felt a chill. What was happening? I started investigating and I found out Jack and Alice had also died in the same way as Matt. It had to be Ben's revenge. But things didn't stop there. Everything started to get more serious and more deaths took place. I got in touch with people who had played the same version of the damned game to know what was different about it from the original. There was a saved game with Ben's name. Usually, Skull Kid would show up in faces where he's not supposed to be, staring at you. And Link's sinister statue followed you everywhere, doing weird things with evil, bloody eyes. One day, I borrowed the game. While I was playing, Link's statue appeared, and when the game was over, one of the screens said, You've had a terrible ending, right? I was stunned. It was a very similar sentence to the one Ben's dad told him before the accident. There was a face that didn't appear for the other players. When Link was dying, the dialogue said, Even though you didn't help, I don't hold anything against you, my friend. So it is true. There is a cursed version of the Zelda game where Ben drowned and Joyce playing with your mind to scare you. His image will haunt you even when you sleep until you probably lose your mind. When Fredward Neal Thompson was born, his parents were too poor to support him, so they abandoned him in a foster home. But he was soon adopted by a new family, the Parish, a couple with a nine-year-old daughter. The father worked as a butcher, and little Sarah also brought in some money as a seamstress. The mother, however, was addicted to pills and alcohol, who suffered attacks of anger in which she threatened her family with a knife. When the little one came to the family, he became the new target of her wrath. She beat him every time he spilled tea or woke up late, or every time he cried or raised his voice. His father, fearful of his wife, did nothing to defend him. He soon had to help out in the family business. He immediately realized that raw meat was repulsive to him. The smell, the feel of blood and guts, he couldn't bear it. But every time he escaped from the carnage, his mother beat him up and berated him for his weakness. The only one who came to comfort him was his stepsister, Sarah. She cared so much for him, and he was so smart and beautiful that Freddy began to feel something else. He fell in love with her, although he never dared to confess it. On the other hand, his mother began to be absent from home, spending whole days away, and when she returned, she would lock herself in her bedroom, constantly muttering something about a debt and the compensation that had to be paid, but she never said anything to her family. One day, Freddy came home and found it empty. He saw light in the carnage, so he went there fearful. Upon entering, he was frozen to see a large man with a mask, knives in his hands, and a bloody body. Oh, 
you must be the son. Come with me. He took him by the arm and dragged him to the meat warehouse, the place he most feared. He placed it in front of a steaming pot, filled with a thick red liquid. If you want to get out of here alive, you'll have to eat it. He grabbed his head and plunged it into the liquid. The smell was repulsive to him, but somehow he began to like the taste. He began to eat nonstop, even though his stomach ached and he felt heavy. Suddenly, fingers and eyes floated out of the red liquid. Wow, you hate your family so much and you ate it. He looked around and saw blood spatters all over the walls. They had been killed right here. Your mother owed us a debt, and she put you in payment. Freddy started screaming and whimpering, and collapsed on the ground. The man left him there, while the young man banged his head against the wall, as if he wanted to wake up from a nightmare. Finally, he ended up losing consciousness, exhausted. He woke up days later in a clinic. Nobody explained to him about what had happened, and he was little by little burying it in his memory. When he recovered, a new family arrived to take him away and give him a new home. They were an endearing and loving couple, who cared to give him everything he needed, especially a lot of affection. It was a novelty for Freddy. He finally felt accepted. Time passed, but he was never able to forget that feeling when he ate human flesh for the first time. The meat of the animals did not satisfy him, and he began to make small homicidal escapades in search of victims, usually defenseless children. He was afraid of breaking his new family balance, but the hunger was more powerful than his will. One day his father came home, and he found his wife on the ground. Her limbs were eaten, her entrails out, and she had almost no face. Beside her was Freddy kneeling, with his clothes covered in blood. He got up and hugged his father. I love you, Papa. The man whispered, you're not my son. We were right to leave you the first time, and we never should have come back for you. Freddy was shocked. Those who had taken him in fondly, whom he had attacked, were actually his biological parents. Don't worry, Dad. I still love you. And then he bit his neck slowly, letting blood gush out. His father didn't resist, and Freddy finished the task of eating his neck, his belly, and his face. When he finished, he felt a deep regret. Everyone he had loved in his life, his stepsister Sarah, his biological parents, they were no longer. He had eaten them, as if he wanted to carry them inside forever. Suddenly he began to feel nauseous and began to expel some remains of bodies. He felt lonely and desperate. He began to wander the streets and inadvertently returned to the clinic where he had been. Maybe that was his place, locked in a room, separated from the rest. He passed through the maternity area and noticed one woman among all of them. Her eyes were familiar. When he got closer, he recognized her and called her by name. There was no doubt, it was his stepsister Sarah. The one who had supported him so much, with whom he had been so in love. He had finally gotten back someone he cared about, someone with whom to share his life. But when he looked down at her curved belly, a mixture of feelings washed over him. Anger, sadness, despair. The woman he loved was expecting a child from someone else. Freddy hugged her and began to kiss her compulsively. I love you, Sarah. She tried to get away, but it was impossible. I love you, and I'll carry you with me forever. Suddenly, the kisses turned into ravenous bites, and Freddy began to devour her lips and cheeks. She tried to scream, but her voice soon drowned out and she fell to the ground. The people around them panicked, but no one dared to approach. Freddy continued to devour Sarah's body and guts. Suddenly, he heard a child cry and he held the newborn in his arms, soaked in blood. Don't worry, Sarah and I will take care of you. All of us. Sarah, my parents, they're all in me. Freddy looked at the puzzled people around him. I'm not crazy, I'm just hungry. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like it. And if you want to see more Draw My Life videos, subscribe to our channel. See you in the next episode.